Greetings, my name is Dan Halligan and I am the game developer for Obsession. Welcome to a Kayenta Games video showing a two-player setup. I'm going to be setting up for a two-player game. I'll be putting one player on the left side, one on the right, and I'm going to give the first player marker to the player on the right. Set out the four player boards that come with the game. The only difference between the player boards are these family bonuses described in the lower right hand corner along with a little unique artwork for each family. Beginning with the first player and going clockwise, players will choose a particular family. In this setup I will assign Ponsonby to the starting player and I will give family Cavendish to the player on the left side of the screen. The unused player boards are returned to the box. Locate the reputation wheel markers, which are round circular chits. The numbers are two-sided, covering from one to six. The max tile is the same on both sides. Place the number one on the player board in the circle that is marked reputation with the lion rampant beneath. This is the area where we will track the player's reputation over the course of the game. These chits will be used later in the game. Place them nearby. Locate two of the black hexagonal markers in the box and place this reputation wheel marker in position one around the reputation wheel. This marker will be used to track our reputation. Note that as reputation accumulates, we go clockwise and when you travel with an additional reputation across the top of the wheel, the level of reputation for the family increments. To begin the game, place it in position one so that we show the lowest possible reputation of level one position one when we begin play. Here we find that the Cavendishes have a family bonus of a higher reputation than the other players. They begin the game at level one position four. Since we've taken care of the family bonus for Cavendish, let's address the family bonus for Ponsonby. The Ponsonbys are the wealthiest family, and they begin the game with 300 pounds. Locate three 100-pound coins in the box and place them near the Ponsonby player board. Players begin with the same five starting servants. The butler, the housekeeper, the valet, the lady's maid, and the footman. There are three places where servants are placed on the player board, the rightmost space is labeled available service. To begin the game, place those starting servants in the available service box. The country estate improvement organizer and place them in one of two locations. If space is tight, as in this example, the organizer can go immediately below the player board and the grain of the wood is actually matched up so it'll have a pleasing look. If you have plenty of room, you can place it off to one side. It'll give a little more room for building out your country estate. Since space is tight here, we will do the position below the player board. Each player begins with the same set of five improvement tiles. Those improvement tiles are marked as starter improvement tiles by the building icon in the upper right hand corner. Place these under their corresponding category. And if you see a rose on one of those tiles, it's just been flipped over. Flip it back so that you see the building icon and place the tile. Each player begins with the same four family cards, which represent the gentleman of the house, the lady of the house, the young lady of the house, and the heir. These cards can be identified in three ways. In the description, you will see the family name, Ponsonby. In the frame in the upper left-hand corner, you will see a matching crest to the one that's on the player board. And you will also see above that crest the first initial of the last name. Players are going to develop a gentry deck over the course of the game. That refers to the social elite, and it represents an inner circle of acquaintances that will be invited to social events that are hosted at the family's house. The base of that deck are the four family cards. Added to those four family cards will be drawn from a special deck called the starter deck which is indicated 
by the crown beneath the prestige rating frame in the upper left hand corner are going to be two near and dear friends of the family. This deck contains no negative characteristics. These are all desirable, if modest, guests that are acquaintances of the family going way back. You will shuffle this deck of starter guests and randomly deal two to each family. The remainder of the cards will be used in the game and should be set aside for setting up the supply board. These six cards represent the very beginning of the gentry deck that will be built over the course of the game. The final step for setup is to locate the objective cards and shuffle that deck thoroughly. Deal five to each player. These are private objectives that will generate end game victory points. Players will review those objectives, keeping two and placing them nearby the player board face down, returning the remainder to the objective card deck, which will be used to set up the supply board in our next step. We now move on to setting up the central play area, which includes the supply board and the round track. The round track is two-sided. I'm showing extended play here, which consists of 20 rounds broken up into four seasons. You'll see four standard rounds followed by a courtship event. And there are four seasons with end game scoring here. On the reverse side is a 16 round standard play game. We will begin setup by populating the servants for hire section on the supply board. One places the number of footmen equal to two times the number of players. So for our two player game, four footmen, and a number of valets and ladies made equal to the number of players. And then finally, an under butler pawn, which is placed in the servants for hire area, but is only acquired via the butler's pantry improvement service tile when it appears in the builder's market. At the end of player setup, we distributed five objective cards to each player where they kept two and returned the unused cards to this deck. We will now shuffle this deck thoroughly in place here. Next it's time to supply the bank in the center of the supply board where this pound symbol is located. From the box take the 100 pound coins and 500 pound coins and place them in this location. When players purchase from the builder's market, the cost of those renovations will be paid into the bank here, and when players enjoy favors at the conclusion of activities, the value of those favors in pounds will be taken from the bank. Next, we're going to populate the guests that will be used during the game. They're broken into two piles. The first, marked by a single fleur-de-lis, represents casual guests, which are guests of modest reputation and some of them are guests that have personality characteristics that may make them undesirable. The two fleurs de lis indicates guests of high reputation, which are called prestige guests. To create our casual guest pile, which will go here, we need to combine two decks. We had separated out for the purposes of supplying our starter guests during the setup of the player area, those guests that had the crown beneath the prestige rating frame and were used to represent near and dear family friends and to create the gentry deck for each player. The rest of the casual guests are guests of reputation level one and two and some of them as indicated are undesirable and you can see there are undesirable characteristics for example here with an American heiress where the frames are marked in red and they refer to a penalty. Here's an example of a pauper where the frames marked in red refer to a penalty. These two decks need to be thoroughly shuffled because if we just place the starter guests at bottom, we're going to be concentrating the undesirable guests in the, uh, in the top of the casual deck. So thoroughly shuffle these, much more thoroughly than I just did there, and place the pile in that location. Then we acquire the prestige guests, which are guests with two fleurs de lis located in all the prestige rating frames and they have a prestige rating of three through six. Shuffle those guests and place them in this location. Note there are no negative characteristics associated with the prestige guests. Setting up a game of obsession is really relatively easy. 
but probably the trickiest part is populating this linen draw bag with improvement tiles that are then going to be blindly drawn to populate the builder's market over the course of the game. There's going to be a short interlude here which will follow and that interlude will give a very intuitive grid layout of all the improvement tiles and how we're scaling back for smaller numbers of players. The rules really are not that difficult because we're going to be using all the tiles when we play a four player game and then we're going to do a little bit of scaling back to get to a three and a two player game. So take a look at the layout of the improvement tiles in a grid like this. I think if you're new to Obsession and you're getting a feel for populating the builder's market and gathering the right number of tiles for two, three, and four player games, this will make it crystal clear as to, to what we're doing. The way this is laid out is from prestige rating at the lowest level, which would be service tiles, to the highest level, which would be the elaborate capital improvements, the monument tiles. Even though the monument tiles and the service tiles don't have a prestige rating, we're going to treat these as a zero and we're going to treat these as a seven. All the others have a prestige rating in the lower left hand corner. First thing I want you to note that in the base game you're going to find that there are two extra tiles. An extra breakfast room and an extra tennis court. These are exclusively for use with the Wessex expansion. And so if we're not playing the Wessex expansion, these can be removed from the game. The reason that they're in the base game is that my capacity to make the high quality die cut improvement tiles rested in the base game. And so those two tiles will be set aside unless Family Wessex is being used. We're not using Family Wessex, so let's now get back to this grid layout. Note the number of tiles. There's two of every type of service tile, and for prestige rating one, two, three, four, there's two of every type of tile. When you get to prestige ratings of five and six, and for the monuments, there's only one of every type of tile. So there's just one here. When we play a smaller number of players, we have to thin out the tiles a little bit so that the high value tiles make an appearance on the random draw from the linen bag to populate the builder's market. Otherwise, we're going we're gonna to shield or hide these tiles given the amount of turnover that we're going to have in improvements in the marketplace. So now watch, watch this very carefully. Every game that we play is going to use all the first and second level tiles. Every game that we play is going to use all the level 5 and level 6 tiles. When we're playing a two-player game as we are now, you gather monuments one plus the number of players, your choice, and include them. If we play three players, we would add one more. If we played four players, we would add one more. There are two estate monument tiles because this one is from a stretch goal as a, a really interesting alternative to the most powerful tile in the game, which is that sculpture garden tile. Right now, we'll set those aside. When playing a two-player game, you take one of every service tile, include them in the game. So we're almost done setting up the two-player game. We now need one of every prestige level three tile and we need one of every four tile. We're now done with two player setup. When we go to three players and for four players, you use all the service tiles. We would go ahead and add in another monument. And then for a three player game, we would gather the remaining threes. And for a four player game, we would gather the remaining fours and add in that final monument. So by manipulating the volume of three and four tiles, we're able to help see the more elaborate and expensive and sort of late game improvements that we want to see during the game. There are also three sweet tiles. This is the Sweets expansion stretch goal that was part of the crowdfunding project. 
and it is optional to include in the game or not. These tiles are explained in great depth in another video. For our final bit of this interlude, I've got you out of the holder, handheld and up close and personal with those two groups of tiles, the Prestige Rating 3, the Prestige Rating 4, which are the tiles that we're going to use to scale back for a smaller number of players. For a two-player game, the tile rule is as simple as all tiles with a black dot next to the prestige rating are included in a two-player game. You can see that the second symbol for sorting on the prestige rating 4 is a plus, and the second for prestige rating 3 is an open circle. So the rules instruct for a two-player game, all tiles with a black dot are included. For a three-player game, all tiles with a black dot plus tiles with an open circle. And for a four-player game, all tiles are included. Now that we have a grasp for what tiles are included in the game, we have to answer one last question, which is, what tiles are going to go in our bag for when we initially populate that builder's market for the first time? We don't want to have highly prestigious, very expensive tiles showing up early on when our families are still at the very lowest reputation and somewhat impoverished. The projects that they're going to tackle are going to be humble projects, things like a fenced paddock for horses, a tennis court, or perhaps to renovate a dining room to work on service improvements. So the initial population of the builder's market is going to include all tiles with a prestige rating of 1, 2, and 3, and all service tiles except the servant's hall. The servant's hall is going to be set aside because it is an extremely powerful tile that if acquired in the very first turn can unbalance a game. So all the tiles with the reputation levels of 1, 2, and 3 and those four service tiles go in the linen bag and we draw from that linen bag to initially populate the builder's market and then all the remaining tiles are added to the bag for the rest of the game. Draw from the linen bag those tiles that have been placed of reputation level 1, 2, and 3 along with the four service tiles. and populate the builder's market. If you recall from our interlude, which looked at the relative prestige rating of different tiles, service tiles are treated as prestige rating zero, and the rest of the market is going to be populated according to prestige rating. When you have a conflict between two tiles with the same prestige rating, reference the rules for the sorting instructions. In this case, Sporting tiles are ranked lower than Essentials tiles and therefore come less expensive or earlier in the builder's market. We've now set up the supply board. Next, we're going to populate the round track. Locate the white pawn in the box, place it in the start position one. This will be used to track our progress over the course of the game up until end game scoring. Acquire the theme cards from the box. The theme cards, if you see the icon here, has a courtship couple, and that is in the center of these small cards. On these cards are the different improvement categories, two of each type. When you're wondering about the improvement categories, remember your country estate organizer. There's the five improvement categories. So there's ten cards, and some combination of four of these cards will give us a personality profile for Charles and Elizabeth Fairchild, who will be the courtship love interest during the game. These need to be oh so thoroughly shuffled. Everything depends on the secret re revelation of these cards, so shuffle carefully, keep them secret, and put them face down there. The next cards are the victory point cards. These victory point cards, or VP cards, go in this location. They have a VP in the center. There's 30 of these as opposed to only 10 of the theme cards. And these contain favors and or victory points, player choice, that are awarded for successful courtship or hosting elaborate events toward the end of the game where very prestigious guests are present. These need to be shuffled thoroughly and placed in this location. Locate the cards for Charles and Elizabeth Fairchild and place them around the round track. 
I like to place them right there where it says Elderly Hall, where they live. Courtships take place here, and so players who win a courtship will be getting a visit from either Charles or Elizabeth, their choice. The final step for setting up the round track is to take reminder tiles equal to the number of players and place them here within easy reach. These are used to remind players to take reputation at the beginning of a turn when they acquire monuments. You have now completed setup of the central supply area and you are ready to play Obsession.